Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369, 0703 768119. Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org. Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. The pay setter and past final session are to showcase to us people that have gone ahead of us, that have charted the course, that have done well, that have followed well, and we can follow in their paths. There are examples for us living with us today. And uh, with me in the house today, joining me all the way from Canada, uh, University of Toronto, a uh, student of University of Toronto, a current intern at Vail, is Gladys Olubo Ali. Can you help us welcome Gladys Olubo Ali? You're welcome, Gladys. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Right. Welcome. And also from the other end of the world, uh, all the way from Moscow in uh, Russia, is joining me Aku Afate. Aku Afate is a student of School Tech, School Kava. He's a master student there. Uh, he's joining us all the way from Moscow. Afate, you're very much welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, I will uh, hand over immediately to Gladys to introduce our guest for today. Our guest for today is Mr. Tokoya Deni. Tokoya Deni became born again as a teenager through the preaching of an American missionary in his secondary school, Miss Betsy Lasher. He was baptized in the Holy Ghost not long afterward, and his passion for serving the Lord Jesus was ignited. He was trained to evangelize children, teenagers, and youths by the Christian Evangelism Ministry and the Teenagers Outreach Ministry. He, he had his university education with his first and second degrees, BSc and M MSc in computer science, MBA and advanced management program, Pan Atlantic University, with some other training and management program in Harvard Business School. He also has professional certifications in ACII in the UK, CISSP, USA, OCA, OCP, and ITIL. So, sorry, towards the tail end of his university education, Tokwe Adeni encountered discipleship, which became a significant help to shape the direction for his life and made his life's purpose clearer. After his service year, Tokwe Adeni started with a technology firm, then moved on to manufacturing and conglomerate financial services and currently in healthcare using technology to drive business. His career, as, his career started as a software and training manager, then advanced to become system specialist, national planner, chief information officer, CIO at GT Assure, and then operations director, Mansard Insurance, where he led a team to build the Nigeria Insurance Industry Database, NIID, a tool used by the law enforcement to validate genuine auto insurance. He became the CEO of AXA Mansard Health, an entity of AXA Global, the health insurance company, which by God's help, within five years of operations and serving the people positively, has become the biggest in the industry in Nigeria. He got the CEO award in AXA among 21 countries and got the health insurance company award in Nigeria two times. Despite being a high profile CEO, Tokwe Adeni has maintained his passion for God. He travels wildly, ministering to young people, leading an entity of a global company while running a godly home. We are privileged to host him today, and he's joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. You're welcome, sir. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Now I'll hand over to Fateh for the first question. Okay. Thank you very much, Gladys. Once again, Uncle, we are glad to have you. Thank you, sir. Our first question is regarding your, your profile, which we found quite interesting. At the moment, you are CEO of AXA. 
in Nigeria. AXA is a global entity, a multinational insurance firm present in 54 countries, serving over 105 million clients. And you were awarded as um, the best among 21 uh, CEO in 21 countries. And we see that your career has been quite fluid. You started with technology and then went into manufacturing and then financial services and then healthcare. And right now you oversee lots of doctors who do you do not particularly have a background in medicine. So the question is, how did God lead you through these different steps? Did you always envision yourself becoming a CEO? And how have you been able to excel across the board? Thank you very much, Fate, for this question. Uh, let me start by saying that I owe it to the Lord Jesus for the opportunity to know him and to know him early and for the opportunity to be tutored and trained. And uh, the greatest thing that happened to me after salvation is the opportunity to be discipled. So God said I have more in my life you know, as a teenager and then from salvation experience into discipleship, we turned things around and she began to shape me. I didn't plan to be a CEO. I just said to myself, I wanted to just grow. So as I went on serving the Lord, loving Jesus, discipleship changed everything about me. And um, what discipleship did for me was simple, was just help me to understand the principle to live. Why am I living? What to live for? And how to live the life. So the new creation man brought a new change of mindset, a new perspective, a new life. And so that made me to now know that, okay, I live for Jesus. For me to live is Christ. And whatever happens is going to be gained to the Lord. So, and while living for Jesus, the principle I learned was that I must be very dedicated. I must do everything as unto the Lord. And I will carry Jesus everywhere. Just like the previous speakers have said, I think carrying Jesus everywhere was very paramount in our learning in discipleship. That it is no longer me, but Christ that lives in me. Everywhere I go, it's just carrying Christ. It will take control. It will take charge. It will do whatever we need to do. So as I began to now seek him, I actually thought, thought that I will perhaps just, you know, uh, enter into ministry. Um, and then the Lord said, no, I'm going to carry him. It will be a ministry, but it's not going to be on the full-time pulpit services. But I'm going to actually represent him in the marketplace. Discipleship actually helped me to understand that. And as I put to follow those principles, I just realized that God was helping me to grow in my career from one point to the other, one point to the other, one point to the other. So all across my career experience, I was just living to be the best for God. And I saw opportunities coming for me to take advantage of and to serve and to serve. So one thing that I learned through this following is that Colossians chapter 3, that in everything I do, do is as unto the Lord. So I saw the marketplace as a place to serve God, as unto the Lord. Uh, I used to say that uh, when you serve your boss, uh, serve such a way that you, the boss is going to hold you. Do more than you are paid for so that the balance can be a big reward for you. So, and that's what I learned through this discipleship, that do it as if you are doing it to the Lord, even if you are not paid for it. Uh, actually, that means that to, wait, to, to waste your energy, but I didn't know that it's actually to store a greater, greater reward for yourself in the future. And I started playing, of course, I became a CEO in my 30s, and uh, it's amazing because everybody I met in that company could have been the CEO, but I was a stranger that was just spotted because I needed to just solve problems and God just helped me through the same principle, selfless life, serving others, and I became a CEO, even in a very, very different industry that I was not very familiar with. So again, the That's principle very... of I can do things through Christ that strengthens me. Hello? I, really, really I, wanted, to... I wanted to find out. Can you out. give us some practical experiences? That, that gave you that leverage to rise like that? Give us some practical experiences that made you to stand out. Okay, I think I remember two incidences very quickly. As a subordinate, as I was growing in my career, um, I, was, I was just to trust the Lord for everything. The Lord can guide you. The Holy Spirit is available for you. Jesus will carry and solve all problems. So one day I remember, my boss, my CEO came to my office. Then I was a technology leader. And just came and said, they brought a CDMA phone to my office and said, I have forgotten the password of this phone. Can you please help me? 
Uh, so I, I, I rattled through my brain and I remember, okay, all of the vendors, they cannot do it except they actually disbanded the phone and so there's no way to get the password. So I told my boss, my CEO, I said, sorry, sir, once you have forgotten the password, I'm sorry, CDMA phone doesn't have this solution right now. There was no GSM then. So uh, oh, it was very unfortunate and he left. Immediately he left. Something in me just came and just said, why don't you ask me? So I was, it was strange to me. How can the Holy Spirit ask me to ask him for a password? And he said, everywhere, just ask me. So I asked just, okay, let me obey. You know, we have learned so much of obedience. So I said, Lord, please, can you tell me the password here? And I was surprised when the Lord said 1167. Mm -hmm. And I pressed the button and the CDMA mm -hmm. phone opened. I wow. fell down literally on my knees. Wow. I fell down literally on my knees. And you know what that means? I took that phone to the office. I said, boss, this has happened. He said, what happened? I said, I received the code. He said, how did you receive the code? I said, the Holy Spirit told me. He said, the Holy Spirit? I said, yes. So the man began to look at me in a very different way. From that day, I was like a man who could reveal the secret password of a CEO. So from that day, he magnified me before them. The man came to meet me several times, even when I had left the company. So perhaps the man, the young man that the Holy Spirit can reveal whatever is happening in the secret to, might be a very good person to consult when there are problems. That gave me a lot of confidence. And then when I became a CEO, Many years, I mean, some years after, I entered into a very different territory that was not so familiar with. And that, that also encouraged me. One of the principles learned in discipleship is to know that whenever you carry the Lord, he, he makes a way, he gives the wisdom, he shows what to do, and just follow him. So I, want, I, I was going to be the CEO of an health company, and I'm not a doctor. Everybody playing in the industry they are generally doctors, pharmacists, physiotherapists, and healthcare workers. So I went to the Lord. Lord, what shall I do? Of course, my disciple had told me, pray for me, and empower me, and encourage me. I just learned. I, so the Lord said to me, don't, go, don't worry, go, and I will guide you. So I started going. I got the license. Everybody was looking at this boy that is going to play in this strange place. I continued to do all of that. Then there was nobody to sell. I wasn't making sales. I set up operational technology. My background, I've done all of those things. There was no sales. So I said, God, how will I sell? People are not able to sell for me. And something happened. And the Lord said to me, but you can sell. I said, how? He said, you have sold the biggest product on health. He said, the gospel is the biggest, most valuable product on health. Nobody sells the gospel that cannot sell any other product. Mm -hmm. And I got inspiration from that. And I said to myself, I can sell. And you asked me to go through my contacts, went through some contacts, I called them to give you an appointment. The Lord spoke to me to guide me through the people to go to. And I went door to door, started knocking. And before you know it, in a space of short while, I saw that everybody was turning to the product that was selling. God was giving, and God told me, make sure you have empathy as a core value to sell these services and solutions. So while others were looking for how to cut corners, everybody was looking for how to bribe in order to get business. No, I focus on empathy. I focus on serving the people. I focus on adding value to people's life. I focus on diligence, which are the principles I've learned in discipleship. Selfless mm -hmm. service, diligence, passionate to help people's life. And within a space of three to five years, the history has been written over the industry in Nigeria. And of course, in the AXA Global, I saw God leading, God helping, and the principle I've learned, and I'm still learning in discipleship, has just made a way for me. Sometimes when I hear the gospel, uh, and uh, uh, Father and the Lord Bragule is preaching on some things, I, only, I used to think it's just for pulpit. I began to see direct translation in the marketplace. And I said, wow, oh God, let me just experience this thing more so that the world can be really saved. Amen. Thank you, sir. Um, so we see that you moved from three different, like one sector to a very different one to another completely different one. And that's the way the world is right now. We're in a rapidly changing world. Do you think there are core skills that every disciple should have in order to excel across boards? Um, yeah, what do you think about gaining skills and being competent as a disciple? All right, 
so let, let me talk uh, as as I'm still young also. So I think I'm very close to the young people, and so we can share many things in common. I may be probably not as old like people who spoke yesterday or two days ago. So we can speak to ourselves. I think the core thing, I will start from core principle before core skill. What has helped me, and I think what's going to continue to help because it is timeless principles that will actually continue to drive from generation to generation, is the life that is driving the worker. What has made the world to fail? What has made things not to go well? What has introduced mediocrity continually? What has made things to be more and more difficult? is the life inside the worker, is the person, the person inside that is actually making things very difficult. Things will change from generation to generation. Environment will change, technology will change, advancement will change, research will change many things. But when the life is consistently the same, when Christ is ruling a life, it will adapt to any change in technology or advancement or anything. So I think the core life principle of a new creation life, a life that is totally rid of self, evacuated of the Adamic nature, and Christ living in such a life to serve the Lord and to serve humanity become the core life principle. And of course, in modern day, what are the things that we must all also embrace in skill? We must all have good communication skill. We must all have digital skill and i don't think we have enough time to be able to see how discipleship helped me also to drive myself to have a better communication skill i know people will laugh and our people who are not nigerians may not understand i didn't go to a private school i didn't go to a school where you can easily learn things in phonetic ways and in a way that you could really pronounce certain words i learned in a school that you use my modern tongue to learn how to pronounce english so sometimes things like saying, uh, you want to say where, I remember my first reading in English in primary two then was that I was speaking uh, the letter W-E-R-E -E as where So I said, Emeka and Choma, where are going? <laughs> Simply because I use to learn English. It might surprise you. But then, deception taught us to learn and learn and learn and learn. And my friend and the Lord told me, go and take your master, go and do this, go and do this. When you see a lot of, uh, Many, many degrees and things I've learned is because this actually pushes you to learn more. I improved my spoken English. I, I, I didn't know that one day I was going to speak to white, to black, to different parts of the world and continent, and I was going to serve them. So I needed communication skill. And I didn't know I would need it. I was just being trained. So sometimes you just obey. You just do things well. And you don't know that it's going to really serve you much more tomorrow. So I think communication skill is very important. And secondly, digital skill. Whether you are technology inclined or not technology inclined, everyone should actually become digitally savvy. You must know that digital, you must be very sound in technology. You should be able to use the devices, be able to know what to do with technology in order to be able to advance your career. I think I will stop there. I'm going to ask before I allow Glenn to ask. So, 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 so from what you just said now, you were also not born with a silver spoon. You were born, but not with a silver spoon. Maybe with a very hard wooden spoon. <laughs> so you've been able to achieve this height despite your background. And you followed a clean path of discipleship all the way through to the very top, and God got you there. Yes. I think I always give glory to the Lord. I think I'm just a blessed person, and the blessing is because God always puts the right people into one's life. Um, I die, I, I, my father died when I was two years old, so I barely know my father. And my mother is, uh, is, is, didn't go to school. So she just tried to put me in school. And before you know it, I got saved. That became a turning point. Turning point one, that I received Jesus. The turning point two for me was discipleship turned things around for me. I started training me on how to be fit. I just just to be fit for heaven, to be honest with you. I didn't know that there is even much more that God wants to do with our lives, even right here on health. And I think, um, so it, it was just a focus for the Lord, a focus to serve him, a focus to live for him that began to be, and we just saw that other things were coming around. And yet the same focus to live for the Lord became active in even on, on different platforms. So no, no silver spoon by belt. Uh, every every silver spoon or golden spoon come around as we follow Jesus. Thank I don't think that. I have any silver spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Uh, I'd also like to ask, what's the difference between being religious and being spiritual in the workplace? What's the 
difference between those two? If I can clarify, okay. I think. Um, I think really, yes. Okay, please go on, sir. Pate, you want to say something? Yes, I think she's asking in the context of Christians who are only religious but are not developing their core competencies in order to stand shoulder to shoulder with their peers in the marketplace. So how do you differentiate between a religious Christian who is not competent, who is just praying to God for everything, and a truly spiritual man who is both growing spiritually and in his skills? All right. I think, um, again, it looks as if all of this is, is because of training gap. Um, what I've, as I was growing up before I entered discipleship, everything was cloudy and religious. You think that you will become number one by claiming, you will be the head and never the tail just by raising up your hand, sow some seeds, offering of faith, and close your eyes. Sometimes you can actually even pour oil on your, on your uh, notebook while you are writing, anoint your virals. <laughs> Anoint of textbooks. And I remember my friends in the university just asked me to put the, whatever I want to get, put it in the paper, put it in the water, and just say to the water, uh, uh, just like Elijah blessed the water to become sweet, we bless this water, whatever is inside, we turn to the max I'm going to get. So all of those uh, deceits were just, were, just, uh, were just so common. But when, as I started learning about the Lord in discipleship, I started learning that. In Christ Jesus, you will be diligent. So Paul said that I did, even though grace saved me, I walked far more than my other people, and yet not I, but Christ in me. So I saw that diligence was going to be very evident. So to be spiritual is to be diligent even in the workplace. Okay. To be spiritual is to be diligent to a point of making impact and changing status quo. And uh, one of the things that helped me is that sometimes in the space of solving problems, I will read. Sometimes I will consult. Sometimes I will be on my knees and God will give me an inspiration of a solution. The only thing is that until I solve the problem, I will not leave. Sometimes I have to sleep in the office. Sometimes I have to live in a hey hem earlier morning house. I don't leave work to say because I want to go and do a religious activity. In fact, my bosses always tell me, when, I, when next are you going to Boko? They saw mm. that. I receive more strength as I go to fellowship rather than giving fellowship as an excuse not to perform. Mm -hmm. One of my bosses had followed me to Boko before. They wanted to know. If I recently, one person did say, hey, hey, when are you going to that Boko again? Don't worry. I said, Boko has come to, to us wherever we are right now. So <laughs> diligence helped, research helped, study helped, networking, and being studious until you solve the problem because there is always opportunity to, to solve the problem. So I see religious. Religion simply means being dogmatic, just following a rule, but spiritual means following the law, following the word of God, applying the principle of Jesus in every situation. And that principle will continue to make us to have victory. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much for that input. Um, because of our time, we'll just um, go to our last question for you today. Uh, on discipleship. We just want to see, can you tell us um, your discipleship experience? Has it always been you getting your way? You Was it always pleasant giving you the kind of answers you want to hear, just like you're sharing with us? It looks like discipleship is just always sweet like that. Can you, can you tell us? Right. Um... I mean, it could have been so nice if everything looks like, oh, you, you, you are always getting these good results, everything looks nice, and you are happy. That sometimes that it looks very, very challenging. And that's where obedience, even when you do not know what will happen, is very important. And I, I think two cases came to mind right now. I will emphasize one and, and, uh, and, and talk a little bit about the other. I think I remember just about the time I was going to get married. And I had a lot of challenges. And I thought to myself that, let my wife relocate from where she lives so that she will be free from all the challenges we are going through. And it was looking like a perfect plan. And then my disciple told me, no way. She will stay there. I will follow and wait until everything will be over. And do you know what? We had to, had to say, why? 
But when she's even out of that place, she will be free to serve the Lord. In my own opinion, that's when she can be free so that she can serve the Lord, so that she can even follow me to Goko everywhere. He said no. So I actually began to see that it was painful for me, but I will be. Guess what? That moment of waiting and allowing that to happen, shaping both herself and myself, preparing us for our own, that enabled us to learn how to be patient, how to wait on the Lord, how to allow God to guide us until he does his work. And that has given us 18 years of harmony in our home without any issue because of what we learned through that. It was painful for me that time. I didn't know that I was investing into an harmonious life for the future. The second thing that was also very touching, I remember, there was a time I wanted to move. I wanted to, I wanted to relocate to America. I wanted to travel to the United States. And of course, as a disciple, I said, I knew that God has always spoken to me that, ah, the whole world, I was going to touch for the Lord. So I said, it was time for me to just relocate to the U.S. That's going to be a global citizen and you can go anywhere in the world. And my disciple said, hmm, of course, my disciple will not quickly just say, no, 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 no. He'll just say, go and pray more. Once he say, go and pray more, I know what he's saying. Once he said, <laughs> uh, let's do pray more. So a wise man, a wise son will know that, okay, it means that this is not so right. So I was struggling in my spirit. Ah, is it not time? Is it not the law? Oh my good, I was struggling in my spirit. But years afterward, I knew that following the Lord, obedient was going to be very beneficial. Recently, he shared how that plan changed. I didn't even know the full details until recently when he was sharing it two weeks ago. And he said, he just went to the Lord to pray. I said, Lord, since it is not your will for now, stop it. And miraculously, God stopped it. I prayed and fasted, but God stopped it. And it was good that God stopped it. If I had gone to America at that time, I would not be where God wanted me to be, and I would not be doing what God wanted me to do. Today, I've gone around the world by the grace of God. There is no place I could not travel to to be able to stand for the Lord. I would have just become a small fish in a big pond, rather than be what God wants me to do, be what God wants me to be, and, and, and expressing his interest to the full. So sometimes it's not very, very easy, but we have learned to trust and obey. At the end of the tunnel, there is bigger light and greater joy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you just so take much. one question from menti.com. It's, um, it's a basic question. As we keep talking about discipleship, I see people um, raising an issue that I felt we need to answer. Can you scroll? There's a particular question. The next one. Yes. Now, how do I get connected to a godly, uh, they said mentor there, I want to be a disciple. Uh, can you just give us <laughs> a word on that? Thank you. All right. Um, maybe I'll first pray that by God's grace, you will have a godly disciple who is going to disciple you everywhere. I think first and foremost, mentoring is different from discipleship. Discipleship is to make us like Jesus. Mentoring is just to acquire a skill. Uh, discipleship is holistic, total, focus is on Christ, focus is on life, and it's a uh, total life of a man. While mentoring is just one aspect of a skill, like a business or a particular competence that you want to acquire. How do I then get a disciple? I think the first thing, we have learned also in our Bible studies, there are two ways. First and foremost, pray and ask the Lord to guide you into the life of a disciple you can submit to. And God will always give you and guide you into someone. Or sometimes also, somebody may actually, a disciple may actually look at you and see that God is leading you into you or her to you and call you and said, come, let us begin to relate together so that we can learn the Lord together. In either of the cases, you must pray and have a conviction in your spirit that this is the life God wants you to uh, partner with in order to guide you through the journey. But please take note of the following. Do not choose a disciple that is not also a disciple. Do not approach somebody who himself or herself is not also under discipleship guidance. Because if he's headless or she's headless, there's no way she can guide you properly. And uh, well, somebody said the other time that if you just travel alone in life, you might be traveling fast. But if you travel together, you will travel far. So every journey of a man that wants to be far with God, you must travel with a companion, particularly a leader, a disciple that will help you in the journey, who himself or herself is also being discipled. That way, 
control is continuous. The Lord bless you. Thank you. That's a good shot for us. If you want to travel far, travel together. If you want to go fast and stop suddenly, travel alone. I trust the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, sir, for coming on our program today. At this point, I would like to lead us to pray with a few scriptures I will just read as we pray together. Let's open to John chapter 12, verse 24. John 12, 24. John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abideth alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. And I would like to say to you at this point, if you look at uh, our last speaker, he made it clear. He came to a point where he actually wanted to let everything go and just serve God. He came to a point where he died to his ambition. He just wanted to serve God. It was in discipleship that it was checked and it was said, go that way. If you look at our previous speakers also, Professor Mokolu, even our excellency, she made it clear she wasn't interested in politics until God said, I'm sending you there on assignment. It wasn't ambition that brought her into politics. It wasn't wanting to serve self. And so you see, while we are showing you a lot of pace setters today, we are not trying to uh, disbalance the fact that you have to come to a point where you let everything go. Uh, we are not trying to uh, uh, stoke up your desire for ambition and say, well, uh, I'm seeing many people that um, serve the Lord in different professions, so uh, that's how it will be for me. No, it's not an attempt to allow you to say, look, I can be making plenty of money uh, and serving the Lord, and you are pushing money, uh, and you are covering it under the cloak of wanting to serve the Lord. No, 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 that's not it. If you look at all these people, everybody that God released something to, they first of all died to it. God will never give you what you have not died to. Because that thing will possess you. God will never give you what you have not been emptied of possessing. When you have not come to a point where you are actually able to let it go. It will not get into your hand. God won't give it to you. And you know, I would like to tell us some brief stories as I, as I, as I look at this particular point. For some of us, uh, the matter that God might be raising with you is how you will actually take a stand for him and be useful for him. And it will not be something that looks like it will give you a big name. You will be a silent laborer. You will be somebody behind the scene that is making things to happen upon the surface of the earth. I would like to share, well, a little experience. I'm a teacher. I'm a secondary school teacher. And I'm proud to be one. I'm excited to be one. I might not be known to the world because it's my students that go. But then when God told me, this was a scripture that God gave to me in 2006 when Calvary Arrows had started, where I teach. And God said, except the corner will falls down to the ground and dies that abides alone. You have competencies. But if you go, you will just be one. If you don't bury your life here, you will just be one. And do you know what's sincerely? If you have a special seed that contains all kinds of values, do you want to eat it or you want to sow it to produce more? God wants to produce more. And you know the truth of the matter is this. The affluence, the money, the wealth may not come to you. Actually, Christianity never survives when we don't have people, especially young people, that are able to count the cost and be ready to be sacrificed for the rest to move on. Dr. Funshaw shared something the other day. His experience opened the doors for others that have been locked. He passed out of that university, not doing well. He was a sacrificial lamb. But after him, people were getting first class because he had broken that jinx. He had broken that chain that held people back. He broke that dynasty of darkness. That's our responsibility. That's what should make us happy. And sincerely, you know, part of what God did to me at some point on the journey, I remember it was in Millet, 2005, that God brought me to a point, and I was asking a question. I said, all these men, God, that you used, what did you do to them? And he said, I showed them a vision beyond the grave. And if you look at Hebrews 11, you will see it there. He said, they were desiring a country which has foundation. 
whose builder and maker is God. And because of that, you know, when you read Hebrews 11, you know, there are two types of that story. There's a, an aspect where you see people that received their dead back to life, but there were those that refused deliverance. There were also those that decided that, look, let me be sown asunder for the sake of the gospel. There were those that said, yes, let me be maimed. Let me born at the stakes. There were those that did things like William Tyndale. That was a first class scholar. He had first class in English. Went out to study Greek and Latin. He was excellent in his time. When they were looking for a material on English that was better than any they could find anywhere, there was nothing better than what William Tyndale had done. But this man, with all his capacity and all that, decided to pour it like the alabaster box that was broken on Jesus. He decided to, to sacrifice his life. for. He knew that they would go after him. He knew that they would kill him for translating the Bible into English, into what everybody can reach. But that was what he decided to do. For him again, I see that statement. I'd rather die. If I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. And I'd like to share with you, as we are in Calvary Arrows, I'm representing a number of other people that labor together in Calvary Arrows. We have seen a lot of things happen. Of Calvary Arrows was said at the beginning, following this pattern that you said God has shown you, cannot work. How you get a school that will do well and you are not ready to place adverts, offer big salaries, and, and, and get people to come with big remunerations. When you are saying there will be missionaries that will be serving without salary, they will just be serving unto the Lord. Do you think it can work? People said it can't work. And I remember, you know, again, I'm looking at the matter that was raised this morning. Uh, the, 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 uh, the the sword of Gideon and the sword of the Lord. The sword of the Lord and the sword of Gideon. Calvary arrows was a vision that God showed our father. Brother Billy Aconi. But when we came, God showed us again and said, look, this is what to pursue. This is the vision to pursue. It's somebody else's vision. But I've made it your vision. I've made it what will give you satisfaction. I've made it what you'll be pleased to run after. And so we went into Calvary Arrows. We pursued Calvary Arrows and God said, look, these children that are here, that are coming here, they are your children. I am the one giving them to you. Nurse them for me and I will reward you. And we're glad if that reward was just going to be eternal. We were happy to serve, knowing that God will be pleased with us, laboring over those lives. And today, as I speak to you, and where God said, look, these children, because they are coming to serve, coming to learn in this bush, because by the time Calvary was starting, everywhere was bush. There wasn't GSM network. There wasn't NEPA. There wasn't electricity. We had to use a small gen. There was just one building that was the first block in the school. But God said, yes, I want to make something out of this. And again, I want to again reiterate like we had in the message. It's when God is at something. Uh, when we men have nothing, that, then God shows himself. So Calvary started. Calvary started with us just begging God, may this succeed. With us trembling and in fear, may this succeed. And today, and I, would today like to I would like to tell you that sincerely God has invested me. Many times when parents say, oh, this is going out fine. People are doing well. They say, no, it's not us. We also are like just and watching what God is doing. Is God doing his work? If you want to think it's our competency, sorry, it will never have worked. And we saw that actually what God needed was available vessels. And then he does the rest of the job. Massive things that happen. We have students that have gone across the world, getting scholarships, studying in the best universities in the world. They are doing well all over. And we are content to just be here, launching them forth for God, seeing what God was doing with our lives. You know? The other year, something amazing happened. One of them won a scholarship, and it was a miracle. We're wondering, will this scholarship be able to come true? It was a girl. And, you know, we just applied for that scholarship. She applied for it and all that, and we're wondering, will it come out? And by the end, to our amazement, they got back to us, and the scholarship came true. As I was checking again today by the dollar exchange rate, that scholarship is worth over a hundred million naira. And this girl is not from a wealthy background, but God took her there. From here, she competed with the rest of Africa. Fifteen of them were chosen in Africa, three from Nigeria, and she was able to make it through. The other year, we were able to go to the U.S. for a competition. And you know, it's amazing how God does miraculous things. 
You know, again, I must share with you some of the things that came out of Calvary some of the projects we've done, some of the science projects we've done. It was amazing how God reveals the, the, the deep secrets. Even as we lay on our bed, even as we go into quiet time to pray. I remember that particular year, we were wondering, how will we go about this competition? We had, we, had, we had been invited to the U.S. after some local rounds and all that, and we had been wondering, how will we go through with this competition? It was, it was so wonderful because we just followed God into that competition. It was all God said, do this. We already wrote an abstract that this is what we are doing, and it will work. And you know, when we were telling, being told earlier in the morning devotion, that the answers don't come from Google. We experienced it. We googled everywhere, and they told us that, look, this abstract you have written, this project you say you want to achieve, is not possible. It has not been done before. It cannot happen. We were, we were taken aback. We said, wow. But God, this is what you said we should do. So we went back to prayer. I remember it was after Sunday service. I called the team together. I said, look, this thing is not, is, this is what we are saying. Better go and pray. Let's see what God will do. So we went back to go and pray. And that Sunday, I can't forget, an inspiration just came from above. We received numbers. You know, just like what Tucker was saying. We received a pattern, a, an engineering pattern design, and numbers. And by the time, I just called them. I said, we've gotten it. Because as it came, you know, when they were saying, you need an endowment from an eye. Now, I must point out to you, I went through university seeking this endowment. I went through university being, being skillful, but not being emptied. And so all my labors were ending in nothing. I did a lot of projects through university. They never succeeded. So many times when people are seeing projects succeeding and they think they want to attribute it to my competence, I said, no, 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 no. Only when I came to Calvary Arrows and I responded to the call of God, then the heavens opened. Then the only thing came that I can't forget the day that it was our mother, Sasha Day, and Mrs. Robert Islove that was praying when we were being told to join the staff team. And he said some particular words. I never forgot those words. Those were the points of impartation for me. And after that, the heavens opened. And inspiration came for different designs, different amazing things. So that year, that inspiration came, and I called the rest of the students. It has come. What we are looking for has come. So we went to the lab. And with our hearts in our mouths, we went ahead to do the connection like God showed us. By the time we tested it, we just connected. It was supposed to be a brainwave signal sensor. For, for human electrical activity. So by the time we connected it to the girl's head that was, we were using to test another one of us, and we just put on the system, and we saw the wave come on, we were excited. And that project went on to the US to win awards in the US that year. Even the International System of Council of Engineers were amazed, and Synatics were amazed. I said, this is the secondary school, we expect great things to come out of you. So that was what happened for us. But where am I going to? God worked in Calvary Arrows. God worked in Calvary House because it was his. And, you know, it's just beautiful that we yielded ourselves to see him do it. I know that, I know that another thing that is critical is this. Thank God that we came early. I was in my mid-twenties when I came into Calvary House. And so, you see, maybe I might share this. People like that Martin, was with me here today and Gladys that was with me here were students I met at that time. And I'm wondering, if I waited to call me perhaps at this time when I'm over 40, will I have met them? And will I have been able to touch their lives? Will I have been privileged? Because sincerely, that's what it was for us. Many times when parents are trying to congratulate, we say, no, for us it's a privilege that God counted us what is to come and touch these lives that he wants to do massive things with. I said, that was a perspective. And again, I must bring that to us as we look at all this. It's a privilege every time to touch whatever God is doing with our lives. It's a privilege to touch whatever God wants to do with us. And until a man dies to self, that's that, that, uh, John 12, 24 that we read. Until you come to that point where you sincerely let go of Isaac, you won't see the promise. Until you come to that point where you are completely emptied of self, things won't break forth. Today, we are servicing health institutions. The foremost health institution in Nigeria are getting products from us that we're working together with their doctors. It's amazing. And again, it was a matter of go in this your mind. Step in. We had things that we thought was impossible. But as we prayed, God gave us breakthroughs. God gave us inspiration. And we are seeing that there's hope for Nigeria. We have started. We are moving. Price is coming out of this. And a lot of things will yet still happen as we trust God in this time. But again, what do we see with all our guests? There was a debt to sell. There was a counting the cost. There was a saying, if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. 
Until then, there was no release. Until then, the divine hand did not come on their lives. Until then, the Holy Spirit could not cause a release of the supernatural. Until that point comes. Are you ready to be enlisted? Are you ready to be part of those that tomorrow will be page setters and pathfinders? Are you ready to be among those that God will use to shape in this generation? Then are you ready? Are you counting the cost? Are you saying, Lord, here am I. Use me. Are you ready to be that seed that gets into the ground and dies for multiple results to come out, both here and eternity? Can you join me as we pray? We'll be praying together now. If that's your desire, you see many lives. God did wonderful things. There are amazing stories. There are wonderful things that have happened. Do you want to be part of it? Do you want God to do something with your life? Are you seeking that you also be an instrument of change in your generation? Do you want to be the one that will be bring down the Goliaths in your generation, in your nation, in your space? Do you desire to be the one that God will use to break for things? Then, at this time, are you ready to be enlisted? I will make a call at this moment. Just stand on your feet. If you are willing to be the one that God will use. If you are counting the cost and saying, Lord, I want to be that seed that will be sown. You are saying, Lord, I want to be that seed that will be buried for you to get the kind of multiple fruits you want. I want to be that seed that you will bury. I am releasing all. I am letting go. Yesterday night it came again and again. You have to let go. Are you saying, Lord, I am letting go and letting go? I am letting go that you take control of my life. I want to join the heroes of faith that said, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. I want to see the glory of God in the land of the living. I want to see the glory of God in my generation. If you are saying that, can you stand on your feet as we pray together? As we pray together today, can you stand on your feet? Can you stand on your feet if you are saying, Lord, I want to be your peace setter tomorrow. I want to be the reason why my world will change. I want to be the reason why Satan will be crushed under my feet. Why darkness will be held at bay. Why light will shine and take over the face of the earth. Dr. Fusho stood in Lautech. Light is shining there. Brother stood over there. Light is shining. Do you want to be the reason why light will shine in this generation? God is looking for young people. There's a timeliness of stepping in. Don't wait until it's too late. If I didn't step in when I stepped in, it will be too late right now. Can you stand on your feet as I pray with you? Tari Marianda, ma sem teregerebo sonto Marianda. Lekerebo sonto. Father, you are saying we should go in this our might. Let there arise a generation of young people that will go to take over this land from among these ones. As they take a stand for you right now, Lord, mark them out. Set them apart. Lord, as they yield to you, Lord, identify them. Identify these ones. They are standing to no one but you. They are standing to no one but you, the Almighty. And list them. Let grace be released from the sanctuary to follow in the way. To follow in the way in the name of Jesus. Shamari Marianda Santo. These ones will also set the pace. They will cause there to be a multiplication of faith setters across this world in this generation. Thank you, blessed Father. Thank you, Jesus. We worship and adore you. These ones will also say, we love not our lives. They will overcome because they will also not love their lives. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Can you just say, I'll give you a moment to just make a declaration to the Lord. Today is the first of May, the year of our Lord, 2021. Just one moment. What are you saying to God? What are you letting go? What are you saying to the master? What are you letting go? What are you releasing to him? Are you putting your hand in his hand for him to lead you? 
Can you say it to him briefly? Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father and our God, we commit these ones into your hands. You are looking for an army. Lord, these ones might have been dry bones, but today an awakening is taking place. There's an arising of an army that will go through the land. An army that will not break their ranks, that will level the land. An army that will multiply across the continent, across every societal strata, across every profession, and bring change. Father, Lord, endure them, Lord, with power from on high in the name of Jesus. Endure them, Lord, with grace, Lord. They are taking a stand, saying like Jacob, I'm tired of struggling. They are taking a stand, stand, saying, empty me, empty me. Just empty me. Lord, let there be an empty that caused an infilling of your oil today in the name of Jesus. These ones will go on to represent you in every fear of life. And Lord, there will be a terror to the kingdom of darkness. Lord, you said to, to me this morning in the book of Zechariah chapter 12, you said that Judah will be like a flame of fire. And it would devour everything around Jerusalem. Lord, this wants to devour every walk of darkness in this generation. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, blessed Father. We worship and adore you. So shall it be. For in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.